Okay, now we're going to try and prove our classification theorem for SU2 representations. Let, rem let me remind you where we're up to. For every complex representation of SU2, R on some vector space V, we've constructed a Lie algebra representation of little SL2C into GL, little, v, little GLV by basically taking R star and then complexifying, allowing the Lie algebra to have complex coefficients. So just let me remind you, little SL2C is three dimensional as a complex vector space. It has a basis H, X, and Y, these matrices 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 0 which satisfy these Lie bracket relations, h bracket x equals 2x, h bracket y equals minus 2y, and x bracket y equals h. And we've been trying to analyze the representation r star complexified, um, and this is what we've got. So v splits as a direct sum of weight spaces, where wm is the eigenspace of r star h. I'm going to omit this complexified thing just because it takes up too much space um, with eigenvalue m. And we've shown that r star x sends wm to wm plus 2, increases the weight by 2, and r star y decreases the weight by 2. Just to save a lot more writing, instead of writing r star x, I'm just going to write x. Instead of writing r star y, I'm just going to write y. And instead of r star h, I'm just going to write h. So here's a picture of what's going on. I'm going to draw a blob for each weight space that's not zero. So maybe this is like w4, w2, w0, w minus 2, w minus 4. You could have some for odd numbers as well. Um, you never know. Uh, but I'm just going to draw these ones for now. And I'm going to pick a vector v in wm for m the highest weight. In other words, the weight space that is furthest to the right in this diagram. That is the highest weight. In other words, because we were looking at a finite dimensional representation, at some point these w's become zero. So there's a, a maximal m for which wm is not zero. So we pick a v in that wm. This is called a highest weight vector. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start acting on V using the uh, matrices in my Lie algebra representation. So R star H, R star X, and R star Y, which I'm now just calling H, X, and Y. And because it's a representation, I know that if V is in my representation, so is Y, V, so is Y squared, V, so is X, V, etc. But X, V is actually zero, right? Because X moves us to the right and there's no further weight spaces to the right so xv is zero so i'm just going to apply y a bunch of times so yv will live two weight spaces down y squared v will live four weight spaces down etc until i get to some uh, y to the n v uh, so let me not give these numerical values anymore uh, this is going to be dot dot dot. This is wm, wm minus 2, wm minus 4. And then at the very bottom, we're getting wm minus, well, we've applied y n times. y decreases weight by 2, so this is wm minus 2n. So this is going to be the smallest weight that appears in our representation. And if I go any further, I'll get zero. So let's take the subspace U um, to be 
the subspace spanned by these vectors. So by v, y, v, y squared, v, all the way up to y to the n, v. So the claim is u is a subrepresentation of v. So this is good because this tells us in particular, if V is irreducible, then V equals U, so we, we have a basis of V. In other words, any irreducible representation of SU2 has a weight diagram that just looks like a string of dots spaced out you know, in twos, like so. So it starts at some weight m and then m minus two dot 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 down to m minus two n for some n. And each of these weight spaces is one dimensional because it's spanned by v, y, v up to y to the n v. So all weight spaces are one dimensional complex vector spaces. Okay, let's prove the claim. What do I need to do to check that U is a subrep of V? Well, I need to check that if I take, um, I need to show that if um, uh, vector little u is in u, then first of all x u is still in u, y u is still in u, and h u is still in u. Right, that's what it means to be a subrepresentation. If I act using my matrices, I stay inside the subrepresentation. Okay, well let's just check it for a basis. namely the basis v, y, v, up to y to the n, v. Okay, if I take one of these vectors and I apply y, what happens is I get another vector in the same list, just one further to the right. I should probably have written the list going the opposite direction because y is supposed to move things to the left, but never mind. And if I apply y to this final vector, I get zero. And certainly all those vectors are still in this subspace. So we get y v y squared v dot 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 y to the n v comma zero. And they're all in u. So we can apply y to anything inside u and we stay in u. Applying h. Well, remember each of these vectors v, y, v, y squared, v, etc., is in a weight space. Therefore, it is an eigenvector of h. So h v equals m v, because m was a weight vector with weight m. h y v is, well, this is now a weight vector with weight m minus 2, so we get m minus 2 y v, etc. And they're all going to be in u, because they're just multiples of the y to the n v's. So the only question is what happens if we apply x? So let me get a new page. There's a formula for it. Um, so the, this is the important claim. x y to the k v equals I have to look at my piece of paper because I can never remember this formula. M plus one minus K times K Y to the K minus one V. So this formula makes some sense because, you know, Y to the K minus one V is maybe here and then Y to the K V will be to the left of it and x moves us 
from the left to the right by two spaces. So you might hope that this was going to be a multiple. So x, y to the k, v should be a multiple of y to the k minus 1v. You certainly want that to be true. And then this turns out to be the correct factor. So I'll prove the claim in a moment. The claim certainly implies the previous claim because now we know that if we apply x to y to the k v, we get something of the form y to the something else of v up to a scale factor. So this imp implies the previous claim and it implies slightly more. So let me first tell you what more we can deduce from this formula and then I'll prove the formula. First of all, it tells us that the irreducible representation uh, with highest weight m is completely determined up to isomorphism by m. In other words, there's a unique irreducible representation with highest weight m. Why is that? Well, because I know how all three matrices in the representation act on this, this basis, right? So there's this basis, y acts by just you know, shifting to the right in this, this uh, representation. Uh, h acts on each of these by multiplying by the corresponding weight. There's no choice, that's determined by m. And x acts on this, ve this basis vector according to this formula. There's no extra data you need to know to see how x acts. So the proof of this fact is just the actions of x, y, and h uh, are determined by the above formulae. So there's an, a unique irreducible representation with a given weight diagram. In particular, we know that sim 2 of the standard representation is this other representation uh, or is isomorphic to this other representation um, of SU2 on GL little SU2 tensor C that we discussed in an earlier video, right? We, we have two different representations that both have the same weight diagram with weights minus two, zero, two. So they have to be isomorphic and they have to be irreducible. So this gives us a really powerful tool for telling when two representations are isomorphic. We just draw the weight diagrams, look at them, and we can tell whether the representations are the same or not. The other thing it tells us is that n, which if you go up, was I calling it n? Yeah, n was the biggest power of y that you can apply to v and not get zero. This is the maximal number such that y to the n v is not zero equals m. So that's why we're getting these very symmetric weight diagrams because if you look back up at the uh, picture we had above, you go from m down to m minus 2n, and if n equals m, that's minus m. So it goes from m down to minus m. So it's symmetric about the origin. How does this fact follow from this formula? Let me just copy the formula and put it down here. Well, let's think. Let's suppose n is the maximal number such that y to the n v is not zero. Well, then y to the n plus one v is zero. So if I just multiply by x, that's still zero. But the formula is telling me this is equal to m plus one minus k, well, k is n plus one, times k, m plus one, times y to the k minus one, that's y to the n v. And this is supposed to be equal to zero. Okay, well, y to the n v is not zero by assumption. 
So the biggest n such that why is the nv is not zero? n plus one is not zero because n is you know at least uh, uh, at least zero. So n plus one is not zero. That means this must be zero, which tells us m plus one equals n plus one. So m equals n. Okay, so this is a fantastic formula. It's doing a lot of work for us. It's telling us exactly how x acts. It's telling us exactly which weights appear in the weight diagram and everything just depends on the highest weight m. So let's prove this formula. Okay, let me get a new page. And I'll stick the formula there at the top. So this is what we're gonna prove. Okay, so the proof will be by induction on k. For k equals zero, it's true because we have x v on one side, which is zero, because x increases the weight of v and we, v already has maximal weight. Uh, and on the right hand side, we have a factor of k, which is zero. So both sides agree, we get zero. Okay, so suppose it's true for all numbers less than and then we'll try and prove this statement here. Well, what do we know? We know that xy minus yx equals x bracket y, which equals h. So this was one of those important formulae in the Lie algebra of little sl2c for the Lie bracket there. Okay, remember secretly I've got r star in front of all of these guys so I'm invoking the fact that R star is a representation of Lie algebras. But anyway, um, how am I gonna use this? Well, let's apply this, apply both sides to the vector y to the k minus one v. So I get x, y, y to the k minus one v minus y, x, y to the k minus one v equals h y to the k minus one v. Uh, we can absorb this y into this uh, and we get x y to the k v as the first term. Okay, so that's good because this is the term we're looking for on the left hand side of our equation. So we get x y to the k v equals y x y to the k minus one v plus h y k minus 1v. Now we've got our formula for x, y to the something v where this something is smaller than k so we can apply this formula um, with k minus 1. So what would we get? If, if this were k minus 1 we would get x, y to the k minus 1v equals m plus 1 minus k plus 1 one times k minus one y to the k minus two v. Let's see if I can just extract that and copy it down. Okay, so I'm gonna make that substitution. What else do I have? Well, I can evaluate h y to the k minus one v because y to the k minus one v is a weight vector with weight m minus 2k plus 2 because y decreases weight by 2 each time. So this here is m minus 2k plus 2 y to the k minus 1v. So putting all this together I get y times this thing so that's m plus 1 minus k plus 1 times k minus 1 y to the k minus 1 v plus m minus 2 k plus 2 y to the k minus 1 v and now it's just a bit of algebra to get to this formula so I'll leave that as an exercise for you this should be m plus 1 minus k times k y to the k minus 1 v Okay, so that's how you prove the formula. And again, I've told you these important relations, uh, the Lie bracket relations for little sl2c, 
play an absolutely central role in the classification of uh, these these particular representations, but also more generally for all the other Lie groups. These are really important. Okay, so with that formula in hand, we can deduce all these nice facts that the representations are symmetric about the origin, there's a unique irreducible representation with highest weight m, and the weight diagrams are just sort of blob, 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 where the blobs are spaced out by two and each blob represents a one-dimensional weight space. So we're going to use this next time to decompose some representations into their irreducible pieces.